going. Okay, is recording uh, on on your end? Did it give you a notification? Um, it says ask the host to give you permission to record. I guess I can record too. Oh, okay. Well, you can no. say yes if you want. You you can click on me and do you see the little blue dots or something? Uh, allow to record multi files. Allow to multi pen. Okay, host, you have. Host allows you to record the meeting. Okay. All right. You did it. All right. So I think it's working then. I'm going to say that we're on and rolling. So welcome to Right On Air, everyone who's listening. We're trying a Zoom file today. So we're kind of working through the technical difficulties here, but I think it's working. Today we have Gail Kimball with us from her show, uh, Ask Dr. Gail, on every second Thursday of the month, uh, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Gail, how's your day going? Good. And I think we should add that KZFR 90.1 streams on the web online so people can uh, listen to our shows anywhere in the world. And on that note, too, this is our pledge drive week. So if you are uh, available or open or can make a donation to us, you can tip our show if you want it to go directly to us. Let us know that you're listening uh, either on Gail's show or my show. And uh, if not, it's definitely a good way to support your local community. KZFR does a lot of local outreach events with music groups and stuff like that. So please, if you can, uh, donate to KZFR. You just right. go to kzfr.org or you can send a check the old fashioned way to the uh, street address on Broadway, Chico 95928, KZFR. Yes. And I'm looking up, if you want to call in and make a donation, you can at 530-895-0131. We have people on the line waiting for you to uh, take your order or take your donation. And I believe there are some pretty cool thank you gifts in the uh Oh, there the are. There, there are t-shirts, there are hoodies, there are sweatpants, and there's some um, weekend music festivals that are really something. Yeah, like whole campout festivals. One of them I saw um, had like a full like three day weekend camp, like a glamping or something that looked pretty cool. Uh, offhand, I don't know which one that was. So you'll have to call in and ask about that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. So today we have uh, Dr. Gail Kimball with us. And if you want to find any more of her books, which you've written a lot, um, you can do so by going to her website, www.gailkimball.info. That's www.g-a-y-l-e-k-i-m-b-a-l-l. -L -L. That's right. Dot info. Sometimes there's an E at the end and I always get that confused. Um, let me see. Oh yes, today's book is a is called Global Dialogue on Masculinity. So tell us a little bit about that, Gail. Okay. So um, this is the book and um, I'm really pleased that Kevin has read or skimmed some of it, a lot of, it. of it. I will finish it. I will finish it. <laughs> That's great. Um, so the, the reason I, I started on this is um, when I was coordinator of women's studies at Chico State, I did a lot of conferences um, on male female relationships, changing gender roles, because I realized men are half the equation. And, you know, women's studies, we can't just focus on women. We need, because we interrelate, we have fathers and sons and husbands and significant others and friends. And so those conferences were in the 80s. And I wanted to see what had happened in the decades that followed in terms of how the men's movement evolved, how understanding of men's roles had evolved. And so, and now I do everything with a global emphasis because we, we're at a global society. So um, I can tell you a little bit more about what I found. And then I just want to show you that I, started the uh, book with a photo of my son and my grandson having a lot of fun together because um, I, I want to make the point that we live with men. And this is not a book um, hating one side or the other. It's not any of no. that. It's a, it's a whole perspective of stories globally, which I thought was a beautiful way to write a book too. Um, what do you want to say a word about your impressions? What what did you take away from reading it? Uh, a lot of head nodding. Uh, again, I didn't finish the full book. So disclaimer, this is not coming from a complete full view of it yet. But um, I got up to I think a couple hundred pages in 100 pages in um, from a guy that was doing. Um, I think it was 
I forget the term for it, but it was like a men's health group, men's like stability group or something. And what he was doing was targeting language about five years younger than what the person's biological age was for little boys, I think. And um, part of me wanted to laugh at that. Part of me thought it was like kind of comical, but also a large part of me was like, that's that's uh, terrifyingly accurate because the way I think we treat or raise uh, maybe men and women, but men too specifically because I'm a male, uh, it does not give us the benefit of maturity um, quickly in our language patterns. And so we tend to be lagging behind in a lot of areas. So for someone to identify that and then put it in a group setting and say, listen, I'm going to give emotional language to children who don't have it, who are men, because they're not getting it, for sure not getting it. I'm going to just slant their age back a little bit, talk to them there. And it was wildly successful in that group. So there's something telling on that. But that is, there was a lot of head nodding when I was reading through what I read through of like, oh yeah, I recognize this, recognize this. And I did, um, I did really like to see that there was kind of a, a good discussion, like what you're saying on both sides of the issue. Like this is uh, two parts, not just one part. And so you can't just discuss one, you have to talk about how they're relating. So there's my two cents. <laughs> well, in, in terms of language, what's interesting to me is that girls develop acuity with language earlier than boys. So it gives them advantage, at least in elementary school. And I interviewed um, parents for my happy marriage book. Uh, and they said with their teen boys, they had to say what they wanted to say in two sentences, and then they tune out. And, wow. and the boys would answer with grunts. No. Yes. <laughs> so, wow. so uh, for some reason, uh, socialization or maybe the focus on action and doing in adolescent males, I don't know, um, there's a disparity. And what I hear a lot from couples who are adults is the man come home, comes home from work and the wife says, how was your day? Oh, it was okay, not so good, blah, blah, blah. There's a sentence and he goes, well, how was your day? Oh, well, so-and-so said so-and-so and they replied so-and-so and then so-and-so said so-and-so. And the woman gives this, this dialogue with verbatim uh, reports of what who said and what the emotional situation was and whatever. So sometimes men can be overwhelmed and flooded by women's verbal verbosity. And actually, there's a, a researcher in Washington, John Gottman, who found that men are more likely to get flooded, he calls it, in emotional debates with their spouses. He just interviewed married couples he has for decades. And so uh, an emotional exchange is more punishing, more difficult for the man. And so he tends to often protect by retreating. And then she gets angry and says, blah, blah, and then he gets, he's more retreating and she goes, more. Angry. So it creates a, a vicious cycle. So I think it's useful to know that there, for whatever the reason, there are differences in our, how we approach verbal discussion of emotional feelings and that kind of thing. Do you, do you find that in your own relationships? Well, uh, personally, I'm probably the other way. I actually give maybe too much emotional content at any given point. And so it's kind of been the other directive for that. And uh, maybe it's worth noting that I'm a, what's the um, heterosexual male, I suppose. So I it's date male? women. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess. So I date women. So I get it. Um, I don't know if that clarifies anything in that conversation. But um, I think when you said this, I was kind of thinking, I wonder if the issue of uh, toxic masculinity looks a little bit different per generation. Because I think that was how I witnessed a lot of my parent generation deal with uh, male, female conversations, um, where it was kind of like an emotional flood and then the person would retreat one direction, that person would attack the other direction. That's how I, that's where I saw it. But I haven't seen that too much in maybe people my age, 28, that age group, millennial age group, I suppose. I don't know what the you terms know, are. Right. Someone has thrown that at me like 800 times. So um, I think for maybe this age group, it might be more just distance and not saying what you want immediately, maybe keeping uh, a little bit colder for longer. But I'd also then don't know what the generations after me look like as far as that has been translating. So I think it gets really 
messy <laughs> in uh, any one, regard. One of the, the man that I interviewed who lives in North Carolina named Tristan said the same thing, that he, he feels like women talk more, um, men maybe are more honest, more direct. He, he gets frustrated because women in his circle don't ask directly for what they want. They kind of hint at it and they hint at it and they hint at it. And there's this indirect manipulative kind of tendency. So he he's bisexual. And so he he feels like relationships with women are more complicated, more difficult really because of these verbal disparities. And, and he's 23. Interesting. Well, maybe it's just translating everywhere then all the things are happening. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any been, been any times in my life that I've had that uh, situation happen to me, but personally, I've navigated most of my stuff. I feel like I provide a lot of the emotional conversation just as a platform for people to be able to step on. Um, but that stinks that he's feeling it that way too. I don't know. I can um, see. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Let me see something about the generational aspect. We're going to do a webinar on the 30th for free. Um, and anybody who wants to join in, I, it's organized by silent generation all the way down to Generation Z. So we have men from the book who represent all those different generations, silent, baby boomer, uh, X, Y, Z. So if people are interested in this yes. generational differences that you brought up, um, they can email me for the Zoom link. It's free. It's the 30th at noon Pacific Standard Time. Let's go ahead and plug your email then here too. I think that's a good point for it. G Kimball, G-K-I-M-B-A-L-L -L at C-S-U Chico dot E-D-U. CSUchico.edu. Okay. G Kimball at csuchico.edu to be part of that webinar. That I think will be a really big, really big hit. Um, because that's that's one thing I don't know. I don't know. I thought that it was getting to be pretty separate per generation of how it looked for toxic masculinity or just uh an aggressive, not healthy masculinity in any regards. But if it's uh I guess we all copy models, so I'm supposed that there is no reason in my head for why that would be different different generations. It's probably well, I, I think the same. that your generation and Z and Alpha are different in that there's much less division between the sexes. Like I grew up with oh. girls have cooties, boys have cooties. We didn't play with boys except to throw dirt clods at them or they throw dirt clods at us, but they were, they're really kind of separate worlds. And then they're supposed to somehow communicate in romantic relationships. But my grandson is 11 and he has girls in his circle of friends and they, you know, read the same um, books about Greek gods um, and they do Minecraft together and that kind of thing. So I'm seeing much less differentiation in terms of young people. But one of the men in the book pointed out, if you look at TikTok, at what some young people are saying, it's ugly, it's racist, it's sexist, it's not egalitarian at all. Wait, people are put into TikTok for ugly racist? Okay, gotcha. So I just needed that clarified. I can see that any unregulated platform is probably gonna get a lot of that uh... Yeah, so it's not that they're pure virtuous because they're Gen Z. Which, or, which uh, I should say, no one can claim that that uh, <laughs> pureness at any point. If anyone is saying, well, I'm doing it right, then I volunteer them, would encourage them to come on and talk about what they're doing right, because I think there's some things going on there. But you know, What's really interesting to me is this whole crisis of masculinity that we're hearing from now. And uh, Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri is saying there's a crisis of masculinity. And then uh, the most popular uh, cable news host on TV, Tucker Carlson, is saying that he's doing a documentary about this masculinity crisis that I, I guess that the theme is that men are emasculated by feminism or the women's movement or women or liberals or Hollywood. And um, they have, they're, not, they're unemployed, they're drinking. They're, there's, well, it's true that men are only 40% of the college students, women are 60% in the US and that's kind of typical around the world. So something 
is happening that um, what Warren Farrell wrote a book called The Boy Crisis, where he proves to his uh, best ability that boys are in crisis and he blames the divorce rate and not having close asset to fathers, having their, their male role model because he thinks men parent differently than women and that both boys and girls need to have dads to learn um, to limit setting and discipline and that kind of thing. Um, so um, should I read a little bit from the book? Yeah, please, please. I'll, I have comments, but I have lots at the end. We'll have, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Um, this is from uh, The Hazards of Precarious Masculinity, the first chapter. When I got into men's work, I was stunned by the male deprivation that most of the guys I was working with had experienced growing up, said George Simons. He was one of the fortunate minority of our change makers who had intimate bonds with male relatives. So a lot of the men that I interviewed had divorced fathers that were absent, fathers that had died, fathers that are away at work. It was the minority of the men that I interviewed who had close, loving relationships with their dads. And that is what Warren Farrell sees as the, the secret to successful male development. What, what about you and your dad, may I ask? Uh, well, we had a, I'm sure my father, he listens to my show pretty often. So hi, dad. How's it going? Hi. Uh, I would say, yeah, sorry, this might be team up, TMI for him, but uh, I think we have a pretty good relationship. There were definitely ups and downs growing up as a kid, and I think a lot of the cultural aggression might have translated to him um, of how a man should be in relation to all capacities of life uh, for that timeline from 88 to 2000, I suppose, was really just like be the aggressive dominant guy. And I think that that was a disservice to all of us in the family and because it, it it doesn't give you a lot of good language to talk to people in emotional capacities and it kind of locks you up in a box and so we had to get over that and we did and so now in my uh 28th year of life we have a fantastic relationship and it's been probably better than i've ever had it in my life uh wish we were closer together physically so we could hang out more but um and I would say, I guess, to credit myself in this, I knew there was a lot of problems with uh, male role models and male perspectives growing up from a pretty young age because I was kind of confused. And then I started to go, why am I confused? So I've been looking at this problem for my whole life and I've been trying to kill it in my own family as quickly and efficiently as I can. <laughs> so well, the, my, yeah. the confusion was, what is it to be a good man? Is it to be aggressive, strong, tough, don't show your vulnerable feelings? Or is it to be someone who communicates and expresses their real feelings? Was that the confusion? Yeah, or how you can balance all of that in one personality. So you can be aggressive, strong when it calls for it, but also have emotional receptive, like the toggling on and off is probably the difficult thing for what I grew up in at least. It usually is just kind of always on in one direction, not. Uh, there's no fluctuation with it. And I think that women are given a lot of maybe nuance in that discussion. And then men are told to respond in specific pattern ways for most of the dialogue we get, or at least think about the response in very specific, limited ways. Can you give an example of that aggressive behavior that could have been handled differently so I we understand how that plays out? Well, I mean, for instance, this is a big one. What if you're at fault for something? And this is not related to, I would say, my personal world, but this is like the looking at the problem, like a response, like a, um, an example. <laughs> if a male is at fault for something, how our response is different than maybe if a woman is, 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 is at fault for something. And I would say, usually, if a guy is at fault for something, what I've heard for arguments is that there's kind of like a lot of huffing and upsetness and like, well, I don't know, and a little bit of a pushback versus acceptance and just going, I'm okay, let me, let me listen. Not even, I'm sorry, just let me listen to what, what your side of this is so I can hear it and then sit with it for a second and go, Ah, all right. You know what? That's totally my fault. I'm, I'm messing up real bad. And then respond with it and go, can I ask for some leeway here, some forgiveness, because I'm definitely messing up. That is not even in the capacity for responses right now. A lot of times for men, usually it takes a long time to get around to that point, much, much longer than if it's on a woman's perspective. And I think that's because the language they're given is to be able to respond when they're aggressed upon like that, because it's expected that's going to happen. And the guys feel the expectation and the women are responding towards it. And so sometimes they feel like they can't even get out of it. So that 
breakdown right there. It's just like ships pass in the night. You miss completely. So the responses for things when it's negative, like a problem that they are having or something that they're being called out on, that becomes a problem. The responses just don't match up, in my opinion. What happened to change that with you and your dad? I just talked often and lots and was conscious about what my emotional state was when I was talking with him and would tell him the emotional state I was in at that time. And um, basically transparency emotionally constantly allows people to understand. You have to model it if you want it. There's no way around it. Like in any part of reality right now, I think if you don't model what you're going for or at least discuss it somehow, some people write books, some people write essays, some people write poetry, but another way to do it is just to just embody it for a while. And um, it doesn't have to be permanently. I'm not trying to fix all the problem of toxic masculinity because it's a huge problem right now and some people just don't want to listen to it. But in a personal capacity, the way I solved it was just um, being transparent with what I was feeling at the moment and then maybe asking what they're feeling at the moment. That way they have some time to give it some space and see what well, comes where, out. Where did you learn to, to value that kind of communication? I mean, was your mom? It's the only way I've found success in life. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mom and my grandmother and my aunt, uh, my other grandmother, I, I'm really close with all of the family members in my life. And so I took what I thought was the best parts of them and from the men and from the women too. And uh, I won't say that it exclusively came from the women because I think the men had some good points to make too in my family. But um, I listened to both sides and their emotional states. And then you really quickly realize that people just aren't talking about what they need to be talking about to each other. And at that point, you just go, oh, then I'll just talk about what needs to be talked about. And then suddenly things start kind of like connecting in my personal world. At least. That's how I approached it. I had a lot of people who were really good role models in my life who gave me a lot of different options to think about it and really just helped me pump the brakes on some quick responses I might have had over my life. And basically lots of... Uh, I guess you could call it family therapy, I suppose, just running an idea through lots of people's heads before you do it in reality. And um, I would say 100% of the time when I ran it through my family's heads and friends' heads, man or woman, um, by the end, it was a, well, you need to calm down a little bit and maybe check your emotions and maybe dialogue your emotions or something of that capacity. So that's how it came about for me. Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, to finish what George Simon says. He, he developed men's centers in uh, California, uh, uh, focusing on how to deal with an angry woman because he was dealing with the early stages of the women's movement. He says, I lecture in Finland and other countries and generally at least half the students are from all over the world. What I see is that guys are not doing very well. And that's this toxic masculinity, boy crisis stuff. Um, he, and then Owen Marcus who started um, a group, a support group for men that's international says, guys are lost. They don't have anyone to connect to, anyone to explain it to them. They feel trapped because they don't see a way out of what's called the man box. He says, young men are hungry for what they never got, models and direction. So do you agree with that, that guys are lost? They don't have models? Uh, yeah, and the models that are there are quiet. They're really supposed, they're, they're trying to model like, well, we're stoic. Sorry, I have a lawnmower going outside my house right now. Let me just close this real fast. I think, uh, sorry, I asked that again. The lawnmower totally derailed me here. Um, do, you, do you agree with Simons that young men are trapped, uh, don't have anybody to connect to, lonely, didn't get models and direction? I think in large part, that's pretty accurate. The models that are out there, this is what I was saying, was... Um, I think a lot of them are quiet because they don't have models. <laughs> and so they might be showing something that looks successful or whatever, but it's usually um, in a picture of them not saying anything. And so the models we get are, you know, the same as how women get models, which is like, look at this fully physical and nothing else person. And they are in the best shape of their life. And they probably have a lot of Photoshop editing on this and none of it is real. And uh, that's who you should be and you should act exactly like them. And we don't recognize that about 70 to 80%, and please someone check me on this, I implore you, of our information acquisition and reality is through our eyes. How we see things is what we become and what we understand. Our information acquisition is visual primarily. You can say your auditory, you can say this other stuff, but if you think about it and you break it down to the, boilest, the smallest part, what you see 
is what you're getting almost immediately. And so for the site, the world, which is largely cited, what we're seeing for models come from media sources usually. And so that's where we pull it from. You know, that ties into a, a major problem for young men and women is increasing rates of anxiety and depression. And uh, academics say, okay, the reason for that is because of social media. And if I look on Instagram and people, as you say, they, they're Photoshop, they're um, uh, filters, buy filters, so they look great. And I, but to me, that doesn't seem like it's enough. I mean, I can, I can look at pictures of beautiful women and I don't feel anxious. <laughs> so do, do you think that's, a, that's the main explanation is social media, you're having been invited to party, I'm not, you look better than me, you have better label clothes than I do. Is that enough to explain why there's an increase for sure in anxiety and depression, especially among girls? I don't think it's enough. I would say that it's a good, like, look what's happening for a large portion of it because it's a visual stimuli. And then when you pull that out from that point, it loses the power and then it has to connect to something in reality, which is usually people saying, well, you know, they do look really good. Somehow reinforcing it in a language base in reality. And then it connects. And then the people sitting in the middle, usually young women and uh, young men um, don't have the separation of like, well, I see the picture. I'm not anxious about it. Clearly, this is something that is not real. They don't have a lot of those steps to get to that point in their rational chain. And so when they see these things, it doesn't really pass through their head as a process. It passes through their head as just kind of a just one point. And so they don't think to separate themselves from things they see, things they hear, things people talk about, things that are toxic, even if it's not masculine, toxic femininity, toxic masculinity, both of them, they don't separate that. And so it goes into them and they just build it into their brain. And then it becomes something they build a language pattern on. Is that because the brain doesn't develop fully till we're 25? It's, it's a developmental process that causes that lack of filtering? It could be, but if you're punched every day from age three to 35, the age development isn't gonna matter. I think that it'll be part of it and it is harder at earlier ages, which is why we have so much targeting towards younger age groups as far as ad revenues and services go, stuff like that. They're targeting younger and younger because it is easier because your rationalization becomes not quite stable until a little bit later. Um, or at least it feels wiggly and maybe you forget things. There's still a bunch of hormones, which by the way, totally affect your chain of reasoning and consciousness in a millisecond without you really understanding it or feeling it unless you spend years really trying to feel what that feels like. Not just, I feel strong and warm today. Well, maybe that's testosterone, but what else is that doing to your personality and how has that shifted it? I can only speak on that one, not on estrogen. I'm sure there's different capacities for that, but there's so many parts where this breaks down and it's hard to say like, this is the big thing. But if I had to like look at something, it's just our models for our media sources have been whatever they wanted to be for their for our entire species existence. And it's been a problem since before we've had media. I mean, worse arguably back further in our past of the species. Now it's better, but it still could be better. Hmm. So what, what do you think of this new theme from Tucker Carlson, Josh Hawley, others, that um, masculinity, not just a boy crisis, but masculinity crisis in general is a big, they're a big new theme. They're, Holly's gonna campaign on that, Carl, uh, Carlson making a documentary. So th it seems that it, they're using this for their political gain because it strikes some kind of chord. Uh, it supposedly it does. And I know we only have uh, about 50 seconds left, so I'll make this short and sweet because this is all this, uh... Uh, I'm trying to think how to phrase this in 50 seconds. Now I'm panicking. Uh, <laughs> the best way I can say this is anytime someone has had a traditional model of something and they've built their identity on it and never checked to see if it's toxic, healthy, negative, or positive in any capacity because they've been in echo boxes for forever. Anytime something in their world ends, it's a crisis or changes, it's a crisis. This isn't a crisis, this is a liberation. This should be a discussion of how do we come together as a global species and talk about better things because this is such a tiny part of the discussion. And if we can't get past this, we can't have the much more that comes after it. So this is like one extra part that's like, we have to figure this out before we can move on to other stuff. 
And I want to say really fast that this this kind of masculinity leads to Trump, Putin, Z, Bolsonaro with huge impact. We wouldn't have the war in Ukraine without this toxic masculinity, I argue. Anytime we have some sort of like cutting off half of the language or right reasoning style of people, um, it leads straight to war. Brilliant. Okay, we're on the yeah. same page. Yeah. Great discussion today. Uh, and if you want to find Gail Kimball's books, you can do so uh, first by emailing her if you want the date for that webinar, gkimball at csuchico.edu. And then if you want to buy any of her books, which she has lots, go to www.gailkimball.info. Sorry. So www.gaylekimball.info. Otherwise, have a good night, everyone. A great show. Thanks, Kevin. See you later, Gail. Come on again for sure. Anytime.